Hi, I'm Dr. Narina and I'm a sleep expert. I've spent over two and a half decades helping tens of thousands of people around the world to get a good night's sleep. But today I'm not talking about sleep. I'm going to talk about why we need to come to work and rest. Why am I talking about rest? Why is a sleep expert talking about resting in your waking hours? Is it because once my mother used to say to me, Narina, you're so restless. Why don't you sit still? And in fact, I had terrible sleep problems, which continued until my early 30s. My mother was taking me from one doctor to the next as a baby. I just couldn't settle. I was so restless. Got to my early 30s, got really ill, started on a healing journey, learned what it was all about. Hey, presto, I can now sleep really well. But today, let me remind you, I'm talking about rest. Why? Let me just dial the clock back a bit. Okay, so I am a physiologist. Decades ago, I studied uh, physiology at King's College London. And I was in a laboratory with a white lab coat on. I was a theorist, if you like. I was um, working with tissue culture samples, pipettes, 96 well plates, I was measurement, I was theory, but I realized pretty quickly that actually I wasn't really about being an academic. I was much more interested in real live human beings. So after a series of jobs, after my academic um, qualifications were achieved, I ended up in the uh, city of London, Square Mile, in a pretty dumpy little clinic in the basement in Moorgate executive health screening clinic where I was measuring the health of city professionals, bankers, lawyers, accountants, insurers. And something started to, how do I say, it didn't make sense to me. What I had anticipated from my academic studies was really mismatched with what I was picking up in the laboratory. So we were doing things, these were long executive medicals, you know, platinum level medicals who we were measuring blood pressure, weight, heart rate, spirometry, breathing patterns, um, body fat levels. In those days, euphemistically, we were calling it truncal thickening, you know, to measure the, the, the body fat levels around the middle. And I was taking blood, I was a phlebotomist as well, so I was taking blood from my clients and um, measuring the blood fat, the triglycerides, LDL, HDL, and the cholesterol levels. But sometimes, even without doing the analysis, I could see from the sample of blood that I'd taken that there was gonna be a lot of fat in there. And what was this about? The truncal thickening, it's a very euphemistic term, for too much weight around the middle, the truncal thickening and the blood fat, why was that elevated? Because these people were walking around at a speeded up rate, laying down armor, if you like, body fat, blood fat armor against the pace of life. I remember saying to my boss at the time, Malcolm, what's going on with these people? Why are these city people walking around in a state of survival? So the academic in me woke up, got interested, started paying attention to the world around us. Bearing in mind, this was over 25 years ago. What was happening then? What was happening in the world over two and a half decades ago? What was happening? Technology. Technology had landed on the scene and we had those kind of Dom Jolly type phones, do you remember? Huge, great bricks. Now, of course, we have these wonderful devices, these smartphones, but we, we all became completely and utterly seduced with the technology. We thought it was gonna make life easy. So our inboxes were bombarded. It was a relentless flow of incoming data traffic. We were constantly online, relentlessly mental, constantly in front of our screens, constantly on our devices. And we started to work in a relentlessly linear fashion. Go, 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 collapse at the end of the day. Keep going till you get to the weekend and then you spend the weekend surviving. Keep going till your holiday. And then as soon as you go on holiday, you get sick with some kind of itis, which is why I was always telling my clients, take at least a two week holiday. You've got one week to be sick and one week to actually have a holiday. So we were getting sick. And um, the 
health and safety ex executives started paying attention because there are a number of cases, landmark cases going through the courts, notably John Walker, Northumberland County Council. He sued the council successfully for stress at work. Suddenly, duty of care, stress at work was on the agenda. The employer had a duty of care. So leaders, managers were being told, you've got to look after your staff so they don't get mentally ill. But at the same time, there were all these conflicting demands, globalization meant that everything was speeding up and people had this push to go faster and faster and people were getting sick. I noticed that there was a need to talk about sleep, not least because I also wasn't sleeping. So I started talking about sleep, got sick, solved my sleep problems, by the way. And then eventually I started making, making a name for myself as being an expert who talked about sleep and energy. Because I was noticing that there were some people who were really, really good at managing their sleep and their energy levels. And they weren't genetically gifted. It wasn't about gender or how much money they were earning. It was something to do with the choices that they were making. Because bear in mind, I was measuring the health of people at all sorts of levels within organizations. Chauffeurs, chief executives, everyone in the organization was coming through my laboratory. Something was happening. There were people who were making clever choices and they weren't getting sick. What were they doing? So I started patterning this. I started becoming obsessed with this, these choices. I started writing about it, lecturing on these choices, teaching these choices, as well as doing it myself and getting better and better and healing my own sleep problems, my own restlessness problems. And then I got headhunted to work at this clinic in the city, psychiatric clinic, where ironically, that was the place where I'd been ill and spent a month there all those years ago. I was headhunted to work there to run sleep and energy programs for people with severe mental health problems. I wrote my first book, Tired But Wired, for people who would put their head on the pillow and their brain was fizzing and buzzing so much they just couldn't sleep. And so I started talking even more about sleep while knowing at the same time, but it wasn't the whole picture. The sleep industry was growing and now it's a you know, billion pound industry. We've never been more perfectly placed to get a good night's sleep. You think about the, the engineering that goes into our mattresses, our pillows, our weighted blankets, our duvets, our Egyptian thread cotton sheets, our blackout blinds scented candles, aromatherapy oils, hypnosis tapes, meditation apps, wearable devices. We've come such a long way since the hunter-gatherers sleeping on a mat of leaves in their cave, and yet we can't sleep. And that's because getting a good night's sleep is amazing. There's a reason why we're designed to spend a third of our lives sleeping, but it's not the only solution to this global problem that we're facing, which is about the fact that we're running in survival mode, living in the wrong part of the nervous system because we're not managing what we do in our waking hours. We need to come to work and rest. So let me talk about the physiology behind this. You've heard of the circadian rhythm, the 24 hour clock. It's an oscillating cycle. We expend energy, we recover energy, and we sleep. Almost more important than this, and this is the bit that I really, really want you to pay attention to, because this will profoundly change your relationship with your energy levels, and your sleep, and your ability to truly enjoy those best bits of your life. Built into this circadian rhythm is a shorter rhythm of about 90 to 120 minutes. Researchers discovered the hum of this rhythm within the circadian rhythm in the 70s, but people don't talk about it enough. The hum of your energy is called the ultradian cycle. It's the rhythm of your energy. We sleep with this rhythm as well. We sleep in 90 to 120 minute cycles throughout the night, light sleep into deep, pure, restorative sleep. But also during our waking hours, this little hum of 90 to 120 minutes continues throughout the day. Our energy pulses throughout the day. So there are times when we're sitting at, at looking at our screen, 
gazing at the inbox, looking at the to-do list, and we glaze over, we get tired, and we reach for yet another caffeinated drink. Hey, no wonder the caffeine industry is soaring along with the sleep industry. We reach for another cup of coffee, but what we need to do is stop, rest, do something unrelated to staring at a screen. Do something unrelated to thinking and relentlessly trying to throw information into the working memory in the frontal lobe. And by the way, the working memory is this newly evolved in relative terms, part of the, of the frontal lobe, which acts as the reservoir for incoming data traffic. So you're sitting here and you're listening to me, hopefully. And if that information is going in, it's going into your working memory, which after about 90 to 120 minutes, I'm not going to talk for that long, by the way, but after that amount of time, this reservoir becomes overly filled, becomes filled up, and we cannot take more information in. And we go into a kind of trance-like state called the hypnagogic trance, where we glaze over. We cannot take more information in. Um, actually, we become a little bit kind of gormless. But so many of us, because of this relentless linearity of the way we work, we just keep going, we keep going, even though we're running on a battery power that keeps falling off, we're running on 60% battery power, 50%, 40%. Oh, I can't concentrate, I'm falling asleep. I'm just gonna go and get another cup of coffee. I'm just gonna stare at my device in the hope that that dopamine hit is gonna wake me up and I can concentrate a bit more and get the job done. When actually what we need to do is simple. We need to rest. We need to stop leaning in. We need to stop over-efforting, trying so hard. We need to lean back, breathe deeply, get up, move, come to work and rest. When I say these, this phrase to leaders and companies, because I work on a number of leadership programs, they will often say to me, what? Tell my staff to come to work and rest. No, especially those companies that uh, run their businesses on the principle of billable hours. What you're telling me to tell people to come to work and lie under their desk or cancel the whole day's work. Of course, we do have duvet days and enlightened organizations, some of them do do that. But am I saying tell people to come to work every day and lie under their desks and fall asleep at their desk for hours on end? No, actually, the working memory operates on a cycle of about 90 to 120 minutes. Our physiology operates intermittently on this cycle as well this pulse so there's a simple solution to maximizing energy productivity and then being able to get amazing deep sleep when you go to bed at night because your brain isn't fizzing with the information of the day simple solution i love keeping it simple the world is so complicated we don't need to be told massive great complex solutions what we need is to keep it simple and this is what I love about the work I do. Come to work and rest. Every 90 to 120 minutes, rest. Do something restful. Even if it's just for three to five minutes. Get up. Move. Change the focus of your gaze. Breathe. Get out of your head. Climb back into your body. Feel your feet on the ground. Walk up and down a flight of stairs. If you've been staring at a computer for three hours without moving, the most restful thing you can probably do is 10 burpees or 10 press ups or 10 star jumps. Do something unrelated to being relentlessly mental, thinking, thinking, thinking. And the reason why there is a global epidemic of not only insomnia, but mental health problems, is because we're over-exercising and exhausting the mental muscles of the brain. We need to give them a break. Athletes know this. They need to build an intermittent recovery. Why are corporate athletes so bad at doing this? Stop. Rest. When you come back to your task, you will have renewed mental focus. Research shows that even taking a break, a mindful break of three to five minutes, breathing, moving, eating something healthy, drinking something non-caffeinated, 
hydrating, even doing that for a few minutes can increase mental performance, cognitive performance scores significantly, measurably, task recall, word recall increases when you do that. So come to work and rest. Every 90 to 120 minutes, get up, move, eat, drink, nourish yourself deeply. Think of someone you love. Look at a picture of someone you love. Hug a tree. Smile at someone. Hug someone. Someone who wants to be hugged, who you know. Engage with people. Remind yourself that you're a human being, not a human doing. Come to work and rest. And you know what? You'll sleep better at night. And you won't, probably won't need me as a sleep expert. Oops. The key to getting a good night's sleep, actually, is to, from the minute you wake up, think about the conscious choices that you're making. Sleep well. It's about living well. It's about loving well. Come to work and rest. Thank you for listening.